Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is. Welcome to episode, I think it's 127, I think it is, of Left Side of the Aisle. I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson, and for the next half hour, I'm going to be talking about something that I think you should be interested in. Uh, if you have any comments, questions, reactions, whatever, my email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com, or you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can leave a uh, comment there or get the email address from there. Please, if you send me email, uh, be sure to include something in the subject line like left side of the aisle, your cable show, something obvious that I know it's not spam. All right, with that, we're going to get right to it because this week's show is going to be a little bit different. The entire show is devoted to one topic, NSA spying. Uh, I've said before that I didn't talk a lot about this because I figured there had been so much in the news that you knew enough about it that there wasn't a lot I could add. But it occurred to me recently that with so much having come out over a period of months that it might be useful to go back over that to get a sense of just how massive this whole thing actually is. So what I'm going to do here today is go through a roughly chronological, very roughly chronological account of what we learned since those revelations began. This started back in June when we learned uh, that the National Security Agency, the NSA, is collecting information about the telephone calls made by tens of millions of Americans. They're doing this on an ongoing daily basis, quote unquote, and this information is being gathered indiscriminately and in bulk, regardless of whether or not the people affected are suspected of any wrongdoing. Now, this kind of thing had been reported before. The difference here is we had an actual copy of the court order to allow this. Now, this was after, in March, uh, the director of national intelligence, his name is James Clapper, he lied through his teeth to a congressional committee about this kind of spying. He was asked directly if the NSA collected any sort of information on large numbers of Americans, and he said, no, sir. He later claimed that he uh, had given what he called the least untruthful answer to the question, and even after that, insisted he actually misunderstood the question. Unfortunately, no one thought to ask him either what part of the question it was that he misunderstood, or how his two excuses actually jibed with each other. But the important point here is that he wasn't alone. Uh, in June, the Washington Post reported that, quoting the paper, details that have emerged from the exposure of hundreds of pages of previously classified NSA documents indicate that public assertions about those programs by senior U.S. officials have often been misleading, erroneous, or simply false. And among those doing what is being politely called the misleading was the misleader-in-chief, Barack Obama, who said in a television interview in June that oversight of, this, of these surveillance programs is transparent because of the involvement of the FISC, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which is a special court created by FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. He claimed the existence of this court makes the whole process transparent even though that court only hears from government officials, virtually never denies a government request for authority to spy, and both its sessions and its decisions are both secret. Now, and around that same time, we also learned that it wasn't just our telephone records, it was our internet use that was being spied on. Both uh, the NSA and the FBI uh, are tapping into the central servers of at least nine U.S. Uh, internet companies. They're extracting everything, audio and video, chats, photographs, emails, documents, connection logs, all of it. This is the program that was codenamed PRISM. We also learned that the, that the FISA court, the secret court that Barack Obama bizarrely insists makes everything transparent, that the FISA court had signed off on broad government request to allow the NSA to make use of information collected without a warrant from domestic U.S. communications so long as that information was collected inadvertently. That data could be used and kept uh, if they contained uh, usable intelligence, information on criminal activity, threat of harm to people or property, are encrypted, or are believed to contain any information relevant to cybersecurity. Now, note first that the very act of encrypting your personal data, the very act of trying to protect your privacy, marks you as suspicious in the eyes of the NSA. 
And after that, ask yourself how, if it's true, that is the NSA claims, it cannot access the content of your messages without a warrant. It knows that these messages contain usable intelligence. Now, we also learned at the same time that, uh, about something. This is how the, um, the Guardian, which is the United Kingdom newspaper, this is how they put it. Discretion as to who is actually targeted under the NSA's foreign surveillance powers lies directly with its own analysts without recourse to courts or superiors. The thing is, these analysts have to judge whether or not you are outside the U.S. and so subject to NSA surveillance or inside the U.S. And they're supposed to base this on, quoting, the totality of the circumstances based on the information available with respect to that person. The thing is, what this means is, if they don't specifically know where you are, they are allowed to assume that you are outside the U.S. Put another way. The standard for deciding whether or not you are a foreign suspect outside the U.S. and so can be legally spied on, rather than inside the U.S., where such spying is flatly illegal, is 51% confidence. 51%. That's your protection against being wrongfully spied on. And to add an element of data to all this, if it later turns out that it appears that you actually are inside the United States, analysts are permitted to read your emails or listen to your phone calls to see if that's true. In other words, we're going to read your emails or listen to your phone calls to see if we should be reading your emails or listening to your phone calls. Next, we learned that during the first two years of this administration, uh, the Obama White House continued an NSA program collecting vast amounts of records uh, detailing the email and internet usage of Americans, including the authority, quote, to analyze communications metadata associated with United States persons and persons believed to be in the United States. This bulk collection of emails was entirely separate from that PRISM program I mentioned earlier. Now, this program was supposedly shut down in 2011 because, according to Senator Ron Wyden, intelligence officials couldn't provide any evidence that it actually did any good. But instead of being shut down, the program may simply have been renamed or redesigned because pro uh, documents show that the NSA still today collects and analyzes large quantities of Americans' online data. In fact, in December 2012, the Special Source Operations Directorate within the NSA announced that it had a new capability that would allow it to collect more internet traffic than ever before. Fully 75%, scratch that, more than 75% of all internet traffic in the U.S. now passes through an NSA filter, and the NSA can actually take more than half of that and store it in its own repositories. Come July, that was all in June now. Come July, we started to learn more about this FISA court, this secret court whose very secrecy somehow creates transparency in government. How this FISA court has turned itself into what the New York Times called, quoting the Times, almost a parallel Supreme Court, serving as the ultimate arbiter on surveillance issues and delivering opinions that will li most likely shape intelligence practices for years to come. In more than a dozen classified rulings, I'm still quoting the Times here, in more than a dozen classified rulings, the court has created a secret body of law, given the National Security Agency the power to amass vast collections of data on Americans while pursuing not only terrorism suspects, but also people possibly involved in nuclear proliferation, espionage, and cyber attacks. Now, in order to do this, this court has embraced multiple ways of expanding the power of the spooks to poke, prod, and pry into our privacy. Multiple ways to justify giving this all but unlimited power of the NSA, uh, and, and other agencies, by the way, not just the NSA, but other agencies, to spy on us in spite of both domestic and international law and the U.S. Constitution. Turns out that one reason, one justification for this, is that just like Barack Obama has his own definition of transparent, and Clapper claimed that he didn't lie to Congress because he had his own definition of what collection of information means, um, the FISA court has its own definition of the word relevant, as in what is relevant to an ongoing investigation. Now, the Supreme Court ruled in 1991 that relevant means there is a reasonable possibility it could produce important information. Well, 
the FISC apparently was charmed by the government's argument that, as one government official actually put it, uh, you can't find a needle in a haystack if you don't have a haystack, and apparently decided that essentially all information that could be gathered was relevant. Uh, for another example, this court has expanded the use of the so-called special needs doctrine. This, uh, the, the effect is to, well, it essentially exempts uh, collection and examination of our communications from the, by NSA from the Fourth Amendment. The special needs doctrine was sort of invented by the Supreme Court back in 1989 in order to allow drug testing of railway workers, arguing that this supposedly minimal intrusion into privacy was justified by the need for the government to combat a greater danger, in that case railway crashes. The FISA court has decided that this doctrine doesn't just apply to specific individual cases, it applies to everyone, everywhere. This court got nearly 1,800 requests for spying authority from the government in 2012. It approved every single one of them, which could be its own new definition, I suppose, of transparency. All right, we'll also learn, again, this is in July, that there are multiple independent surveillance programs with names like Evil Olive, Shell Trumpet, Moonlight Path, and Spinneret. And another one called X Keyscore that with uh, an email address and a couple of keystrokes would allow an analyst access to nearly everything you do online, from chat sessions to email to web browsing. Edward Snowden, the man whose release of these documents made, made much of this information possible, said, quoting, I, sitting at my desk, could wiretap anyone, uh, from you or your accountant to a federal judge or even the president, if I had a personal email. This program allows analysts with no prior authorization to search through databases containing emails, online chats, browsing histories of millions of Americans. Or you know, come August. Come August, we were told about a secretive unit of the Drug Enforcement Administration called the Special Operations Division. This apparently has access to the NSA's database of telephone records and is using it to launch criminal investigations of Americans, not national security or terrorism cases, ordinary criminal cases of American citizens, after which the law enforcement agencies that make use of this information, quote, recreate, unquote, the investigative trail, which means they lie about how this investigation got started in order to keep the involvement of the Special Operations Division a secret. Early in August, journalists actually noted something that had been overlooked in one of the documents from June. Under the 2008 amendments to FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, the NSA could do cross-border surveillance. That is, it could spy on U.S. soil without a warrant, so long as the target was a non-citizen who was outside the U.S. at the time of the spying. In a set of rules as to how the NSA is going to you know, do this, how it's going to carry it out, one rule, the only rule marked top secret, says that the agency, quote, seeks to acquire communications about the target that are not to or from the target. In other words, the NSA is not just intercepting the communications of Americans who are in contact with uh, some foreigner targeted overseas. It's also intercepting almost all the communications of Americans that either start from outside the U.S. or go from the U.S. outside the U.S. and to search them without warrants for any that make reference to or have some link to uh, the person who is supposedly being targeted. And supposedly, this is all okay because those foreigners are still the ones being targeted. Timothy Edgar, a former intelligence official in both the Bush and Obama administration, said, quote, there is an ambiguity in the law about what it means to target someone. You know, in the, the sci-fi fantasy classic Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Arthur Dent Upon being told he is safe in a cabin of one of the spaceships of the Vogon constructor fleet, which has just destroyed the planet Earth, says, this is obviously some strange usage of the word safe that I hadn't previously been aware of. We should all understand how he feels, as it appears that in the minds of the spooks, Target joins transparent, collect, and relevant with its own strange usage we hadn't previously been aware of. We're going to take a quick break. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, and we're back. And remember, we are still in Re Revelations that came out in August of this year. Uh, we found out early in August, in fact, that the NSA has a secret back door into its databases under a legal authority from the Obama administration that enables it to search for U.S. citizens' email and phone calls without a warrant. Now, the thing is, under FISA, again, the NSA can target people for surveillance without a warrant if they are a foreign person outside the United States at the time of this uh, the spying. And that applies even if the other end of that conversation is with a U.S. person or inside the United States. That's that cross-border stuff I talked about before. The point here is that the NSA admits that information about purely domestic communications can be inadvertently gathered up at the same time and put in the databases. And under this new rule, which dates from 2011, under this new rule, operatives can hunt for individual Americans' communications using their name or whatever identifying information, even if they are inside the U.S. and even if they are not actually targets for surveillance. As long as it's in the database, they can search for it without a warrant, even if it shouldn't have been in the database in the first place. So much for the claims by Obama and senior spooks that our privacy is being protected. Oh, but wait, it is, it is, it must be. There are rules. And we all know the NSA agents would never break the rules. <laughs> Except, of course, they have rather frequently, it turns out. Uh, in mid-August... Well, I should say that it, 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 since Congress granted the NSA the new powers in 2008, in mid-August it was discovered that in the time since, the agency has broken its private, own privacy rules or overstepped its legal authority literally thousands of times a year, and the NSA knew it. And that, in fact, is a minimum because it's based on an internal agency audit that only looked at the NSA's facilities in and around Washington, D.C., and three separate government officials who spoke to the Washington Post about this said that number would have been multiplied if they'd looked at all the uh, NSA facilities around the country. Now, some of these violations were truly accidental. There was one case, at least, where there was some improper spying because of a typographical error in an area code. Uh, but a lot of these others weren't. They included uh, willful violation of court orders. They included conducting programs without even telling the court that they were being done. And on top of which, officials decided that some of these violations, oh, we don't even have to report those. And they hid others from the court and the Justice Department by taking out the details and substituting generic language in their reports. In other words, they covered it up. And there were other abuses that weren't even social or political, they were personal. The NSA admitted in August that some of its analysts had deliberately abused uh, its own surveillance systems to spy on people in who they had a romantic interest, or in at least one case, a former spouse. The agency insists this is rare, but it's common enough to have gotten its own nickname. Just like uh, Spooks used the term SIGINT for signal intelligence, this is called love int. And as the NSA champions in and out of the executive branch hope you have forgotten, there was the fact that back in 2008, the NSA was found, NSA personnel were found routinely listening in on the intimate and innocent phone calls of Americans in Iraq, including government personnel, journalists, aid workers, and soldiers as they called back into the United States. And then they would tell other analysts to call, bring up and listen to these calls because they were funny or had good phone sex or something. Now, also, again, in this year, August, the NSA, which would never break the rules, admitted that in each of the years, 2008 to 2011, one of its programs had wrongfully gathered as many as 56,000 emails and other communications by Americans per year, Americans who were not thought to have any connection to terrorism whatsoever. In fact, that revelation came as the result of a suit by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which fought the government in a, for a year in court to get this stuff declassified. Also in August, we learned the fact that the U.S.'s surveillance program violates an international agreement with the European Union to, uh, that's meant to ensure the security of cross-border communications. We learned that when Germany started demanding that the U.S. make a new agreement about this after its own uh, independent privacy watchdogs raised an alarm. And it's not just our European allies that we are targeting. The NSA is also spying on the United Nations. It's cracked the encryption code needed for the organization's internal video conferencing calls. 
Such a spying of the United Nations is illegal under international law. Now, it turns out the U.S. isn't the only nation doing this, but it doesn't make it any less illegal. All right, now we come to September. And one of the things we learned in September is that the Qatar-based news agency Al Jazeera was targeted by the NSA. The NSA hacked into Al Jazeera's internal communication system. Apparently, the fact that it's an Arab news uh, source, uh, even though it's become widely respected worldwide, the fact that it was Arab was enough to raise the suspicions. Okay, next. Remember how I said that um, in August, it came out that the NSA has a secret back door into its vast databases, a loophole enabling it to search those databases for, you know, our email and our phone calls without a warrant that is, in effect, to target U.S. citizens? In September, it came out that in 2008, the FISC, the FISA court, had specifically banned those sorts of searches until the Obama administration convinced the court in 2011 to reverse those restrictions specifically to allow for those sorts of searches, and they in fact have been done. Now in addition, the FISA court also lengthened the time the NSA is allowed to keep these sorts of communications from five years to six years, and even longer under some circumstances. And remember, thing, this is being done under the color of a law that was specifically intended, supposedly, to target foreigners outside the United States. And this may actually uh, uh, refer even to this, this, this permission, may refer to purely domestic communications supposedly gathered up inadvertently and by which rights shouldn't be in the database at all. Government officials actually defend this, defend this policy, defend essentially throwing away the Fourth Amendment where the NSA is concerned on the grounds that, to come to the nub of the argument, hey, if we got it, we can use it. And don't think that encrypting your communication is going to help you. Early this month, early September, the New York Times reported that, quoting, the National Security Agency is winning its long-running secret war on encryption using supercomputers, technical trickery, court orders, and behind-the-scenes persuasion to undermine the major tools protecting the privacy of everyday communications in the Internet age. Global commerce, banking systems, trade secrets, medical records, emails, web searches, Internet chats, phone calls, none of it is safe. In fact, the German newspaper Der Spiegel reported in mid-September that the NSA has set up its own financial database to track money flows through what's called a Tailored Access Operation Division, which monitors international payments, banking, and credit card transactions. This spying is conducted by a branch called Follow the Money. The, the information they collect goes into the NSA's financial data bank, which is called TrackFin, in 2011, that contained 180 million records, some 84% of which is from credit card transactions focused on customers in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Now, this is another case where it's not supposed to affect U.S. citizens, but may well anyway, especially because another specified target of the agency is SWIFT, which is a worldwide network used by thousands of banks to securely do transactions. Apparently, again, wanting your financial transactions to be secure and remain personal is, like everything else in the eyes of the spooks, suspicious. And even if this doesn't affect Americans, it makes mincemeat out of the claim that the whole spying apparatus is designed to target foreign terrorists. Except, on the other hand, target already has its new definition, and it's long been clear that terrorist is, to put it mildly, a flexible term. So maybe foreign also has its own strange usage we hadn't previously been aware of. Now, many Internet users assume their data is safe, and the NSA wants to keep it that way. The agency treats its success in deciphering encrypted information done under a classified program called Bull Run. This is one of its most closely guarded secrets. It especially doesn't want you to know about its covert measures to ensure its control over the international encryption standards up to and including collaboration with technology companies and internet service providers themselves, through which the agency has inserted backdoors into commercial encryption software, which allows the agency to simply go around any protections this software supposedly offers. Ordinary users, tellingly referred to in these documents as adversaries, are not even supposed to know such backdoors exist. 
To show you how important this is for the spies, funding for this program is more than 12 times the PRISM program that monitors the internet usage. And by the way, none of the companies involved in this are known uh, because those details are even more highly classified than the program itself is. All right, one last thing for now. One other thing that the government really, really, really doesn't want you to know, but which we learned about in September, is that the United States routinely turns over raw intelligence data to Israel without filtering it to remove information about U.S. citizens. This despite the indignant assurances of rigorous safeguards to protect the privacy of American citizens, uh, those citizens whose data is swept up in these NSA nets. Those assurances apparently are bold-faced lies, at least when it comes to dealings with Israel. And Israel, in fact, can do whatever it damn well pleases with this information. The agreement specifically says that it, quote, is not intended to create any legally enforceable rights and shall not be construed to be either an international agreement or a legally binding instrument according to international law. In short, there are no restrictions on what Israel can do, with one exception. The agreement requires the Israelis to destroy upon recognition, quote unquote, any communication, quote, that is either to or from an official of the U.S. government, including, quote, officials of the executive branch, including the White House cabinet departments and independent agencies, the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate members and staff, and the U.S. federal court system, including but not limited to the Supreme Court, unquote. The Guardian pointedly notes that it's not clear how or why the NSA would be in possession of such communications. But what is clear is that the government is saying that the communications, its communications must remain private and protected while yours must be open to any prying eyes. I've said before, I've said it before, the goal here, a goal eagerly embraced and vigorously pursued by the Obama administration, is for them to know more and more about us and for us to know less and less about them. Now, we're going to leave that for now. Next week, what I intend to do is to address some of the rather lame excuses and defenses that uh, have been made of this by the White House and other agencies and um, the rather lame, extremely lame proposals for, quote, reform, unquote, that the amazing Mr. O has suggested. But we'll get to that next week. For right now, I'm going to leave you with this, our regular weekly reminder. As of September 24th, at least 8,654 Americans have been killed by guns in the United States since Newtown, at least 87 of them in Massachusetts. We'll be back next week with more on this and hopefully maybe some good news too, but for now, you have the best we could possibly can, and we will see you next week.